Thank you very much, uh, Minister, and thank you to my friends and colleagues, uh, Diana and John, for their very thoughtful, thoughtful perspectives from their different positions. Now, my position in terms of discipline is uh, from economics, um, although I share many of the analytical perspectives, of course, that Diana and John have put. Now, um, most of what I say has got some quite uh, thoughtful economics, analytical economics underneath it, but I'm not going to bring too much of it to the surface because I realize that uh, most of you here are scientists and not e economists. Um, that is your fault. You could have made different choices in the past. <laughs> but I'm not going to uh, push the basic economics too hard at you. But those of you who are economics will see quite a lot, I hope, of the economics underneath what I'm going to say. And I came to this as someone who spent a lifetime working on economic policy in developed and particularly developing countries, and um, therefore as a consumer of the science. And I hope as a moderately rational consumer, the first thing I did was to contact John Schellenhuber. And I remember a very long tutorial in uh, uh, an English summer's day in the Treasury where uh, John uh, gave me my first sort of exposure to uh, talking, as opposed to just reading, uh, to talking uh, serious scientists on this subject. So uh, thank you again in front of all your fellow scientists, John, for that tutorial. It made an enormous difference. Now, what I want to start with is to say how the economics should be shaped by the science. Then I'll say something about how the economics tells us, uh, I hope, a good deal about what kinds of policies we should adopt. Uh, thirdly, I'll say something about the global deal based on that kind of uh, scientific and economic analysis. And lastly, uh, many of you who will have noticed that uh, even the most scientific of you in your lab laboratories, that the world is facing rather a difficult time. And uh, what I want to do is to relate uh, the challenges that we face as a world on climate change to the economic crisis, which is profound, that we are uh, now in. So I'll have to move pretty rapidly. First thing that the science tells us is that our emissions cause damage to others. That, for the economist, is an externality. If something you do affects the production and consumption possibilities of other people, that's an externality. And we're very familiar with that kind of thing. The congestion we cause by driving our car, we slow down other people. That's an externality. If we um, send out uh, noxious uh, smells or um, soot from where we're working or where we're where we're uh, consuming, we damage directly our neighbours. We know about those kinds of externalities, and normally we adopt one of two things. We tax people, we confront people through the markets with the costs of what they're doing. That's a congestion charge, as an example of that. Or alternatively, we um, uh, bring in regulation, so you can only use certain kinds of coal, and that's the way that uh, smog in London and many other cities uh, was dealt with. So we understand something about policy towards externalities. Um, but this is an externality unlike any other, and that's the second lesson from the science. It's global, it doesn't matter where the greenhouse gases come from. The effects are very long term, and you don't see them immediately. Uh, the risks and uncertainties are enormous and the scale of possible damage is very large. So these are very different from the kind of externality analysis we offer our students in first and second year economics. And unfortunately many of the people who've written on the economics of climate change have refused to go beyond the first or second year story and they've refused to take into account just how big some of these um, damages are. So it tells us that we have to look very carefully at theories of risk and how we deal with risk. And it tells us we have to look very carefully at global cooperation, because this is a global phenomenon, both in its origins and in uh, its effects. So you get very strong uh, directions about the type of economics we have to bring to bear. And we have to bring to bear something which we don't do very often in economics, is we have to look at non-marginal changes. A lot of time in economics you say, what if I had another bit of road here? 
or another bit of education there, and you look at the costs and you look at the benefits in the context of a picture of the economy, of the economy uh, as it might develop. That's kind of marginal analysis. We look at disturbances, per perturbations around some kind of path, usually a growth path. This is about a choice between patterns of development which look extremely different, some of which will involve growth for a while, some of which uh, will, involve, will involve growth, high carbon growth, which destroys itself fairly rapidly, as John uh, described so uh, clearly just now. So these are about very different kinds of choices, so we have to bring the right kind of economics to bear. And I'm afraid that many of my economics colleagues, because they didn't cope in their analysis with the magnitude of the issues, stuck with their marginal techniques, did not bring the right kind of economics to bear. The third feature of this story is it's a flow stock problem. The flows each year build up into stocks of greenhouse gases. Now that's, and the stocks of greenhouse gases trap the heat and uh, cause the problem of climate change. That of course is a very big uh, part of this story and it comes directly from the simple science of the story. But it tells us some very powerful lessons then for economics as well here. It tells us that costs of delay are very big. This is not a WTO negotiation which it falls apart one year, you pick it up again five years later and you're more or less in the same position as you were before. If you delay this one because of the flow stock process, the stocks build up and you start in a significantly worse position with a five or ten year delay. Now these are all very powerful lessons for economic analysis from the simple structure of the science and those are what we have to take on board if we're translating the economics into policy. But let me just illustrate for you why it was that many economists went so badly wrong on this by refusing to take into account the magnitude of the story. My friend uh, Bill Nordhaus, who is a scholar and a gentleman, and he addressed you yesterday, he's just wrong on this. Why? Why is he wrong? Well, let me illustrate. In his model, you have damages which depend on temperature. Now if you're dealing with aggregate models, you have to keep things simple. How do the damages depend on his temperature? Well, of course, damages go up with temperature. So far, so good. Um, but how fast do they go up? And what's the curvature? And that's the key to the way uh, many people following Bill Nordhaus kinds of models got it wrong. And let me just illustrate with one number. At 19 degrees centigrade, above pre-industrial times, 1919, the loss of GDP in the model is 50%. You lose half your GDP with 19 degrees centigrade. I mean, it is just absurd. You know, we know that uh, we would be in total destruction, we would be at much, much lower temperatures than that. So that's just an illustration of how you can sort of conceal, as it were, underneath uh, what looks like a fancy model structure. Just basic assumptions which show that you've missed the point. And that's extremely important. It's also extremely important in understanding why they got discounting so wrong and how you do the intertemporal ethics. Because they didn't take into account the fact that we were talking about, when we're talking about the very big risks from business as usual, about extremely devastatingly low standards of living arising from the kind of changes which the science has told us about. And if you get your future risks so badly wrong, you will get your evaluation of benefits now and benefits in the future very badly wrong. So most of the story about why many economists, not all of them of course, but why many economists got it so badly wrong is they didn't take the risk seriously. And that led them to make mistakes in discounting. They actually made other mistakes in discounting too about not taking into account how much more costly environmental action would be later on, treating it as a one good model when clearly you've got many goods in there, including the distinction between standard sorts of goods and environmental goods. They got other things wrong in not taking into account capital market imperfections which have come home to bite us so severely over the last couple of years. There was a series of mistakes uh, on the whole question of intertemporal allocation. But the most basic mistake in it all was to get the magnitude of the risks wrong.